Amen. At this time, I'd like to ask for Teen Life Challenge to come. Whoever's coming, you come. Hallelujah. Let's give them a hand. church how are you yep is it up okay y'all can hear me all right like pastor said my name is austin um i am from dallas i now work for the closer to the top i work for the center is that better good okay um a little bit about my story you know i um i like to say that you know it's not a sad story it was for a little bit you know it had some rough moments, but they weren't all bad. Um, I grew up in the Church of Christ. Both of my parents are big Jesus people. So I grew up around Jesus. I grew up with a relationship with God and knowing what right and wrong was and where I should be and where I should not be. Um, as I got older, I kept seeing the way that my parents lived life, and I kind of thought, man, that looks a little bit boring to me. You know, So I kind of I wanted to go have my own life, see what the world was about, um, I played hockey. I went to college to play hockey, so I got as far away from Garland as I could. I went to New York, and that's kind of where I just, you know, I started my walk away from God. You know, started with one left step, getting a little bit further, a little bit further, a little bit further, and then you wake up down the line, and you look around, and you have no relationship with God. You've got no friends who have a relationship with God. It's just, you're kind of alone. You know, you got a bunch of people around you who will all tell you to keep doing what you're doing because that's what the world wants you to do. And I woke up and, you know, I had everything that the world tells me I should have. I got a nice house. I got cars. I got dogs. I got, you know, everything that I thought I was supposed to have. But there was still something really big missing. And, um, you know, I'm addicted and just not really living, not living the way I knew I should be living. Um, you know, I couldn't go around my parents because the first thing my mom was going to ask me is, how's your relationship with God? Where are you going to church? So I can't go around them because I don't want that conversation. All my friends don't want to bring up God. So I finally, you know, I got to a point where I just didn't want to do it anymore. I was tired. I mean, that lifestyle wears you down, and I was just tired and done. So um, I came to Teen Challenge, and it was the best decision that I have ever made. Um, my relationship with God's been renewed massively. Um, you know, he never left me. He just kind of went before me and cleared a path for me to get here. And I can see that now. I know that, you know, my parents praying for me all the way through was a huge thing that saved me. Um, now I work for the center. I am on the path to getting certified with the Assemblies of God. Um, and... It's by the grace of God that I'm here, and I know that I'll be living in that grace for the rest of my life. And the verse that I stand on is Ephesians 2, 4, and 5, and it says, But because of his great love for us, God made us alive with Christ even while we were dead in our transgressions and sins. It's by, it is by grace you have been saved. And I am the poster boy for grace at this point. So Amen. thank you all, um, and God bless you.
doing today? Good morning, church. My name is Caleb Lord Heiser. I'm from Fredericksburg, Texas. It's a hill country of Texas. That's pretty awesome over there during springtime with the blue bonnets. Well, um, I'm here to kind of tell you a little bit about my testimony. Uh, I grew up uh, in the church. I grew up uh, uh, very much uh, surrounded by miracles and uh, signs and wonders and things like that. Uh, my dad was kind of a conference junkie. Uh, I lost my brother when oh, he was eight years old, and my dad always kind of blamed himself, like uh, like he wished that there was more he could do. So he so we would just go all around and go to these conferences, healing things like that. And um, skip forward ahead of time, uh, I, I I I delivered all four of my kids. I got two girls and two boys. I'm 38 years old. Uh, about uh, 12, I uh, spent all my 20s married and uh, most of my 30s. And uh, uh, here recently, I guess about a year and a half ago, uh, my wife uh, kind of left me for my best friend. Uh, I mean, he ended up going back to his wife and, and daughter, but uh, I was pretty devastated. And I uh, kind of got mad at God a little bit, or just kind of, first of all, I, I, uh, I, my addiction was... Uh, I guess money and status as far as I, I wanted to be a good covering. I wanted to be a safe place. 
for my family. And uh, I ended up, in turn, working 17-hour days and just uh, had a, a major company, uh, about nine employees. And so I didn't just have my own family to take care of. I had several others. And uh, in turn, that, that kept me far away from home, uh, overworking. And I guess that's where the enemy crept in. And uh, so I've dealt a lot with uh, condemnation and uh, dealt a lot with, uh, like, self-blame and things like that. And through that, I started uh, drinking uh, a lot and uh, taking anxiety medication. But where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom, amen? Uh, I, uh, I want to say that I stand on the joy of the Lord as my strength. Um, I've kind of come back to him through this program of Teen Challenge, Adult Teen Challenge. And I also want to thank my brothers. have been a rock for me. Uh, been awesome. Uh, we have days where we fight and argue sometimes, but we all got each other's back at the end of the day. And we come from all kinds of different backgrounds and, and all that. Um, also, I wanted to stand on the verse Hebrews 4.11. It's about entering into God's rest. It says, therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful none of you be found to have fallen short of it. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's powerful to me. Uh, as someone who was on the hamster wheel of religion a long time and just, uh, you know, being a human doing rather than a human being. Um, I wanted to uh, speak a benediction over you, church, if you allow me. It's uh, from Numbers 6. 24 through 26. It says, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. I appreciate you guys for having me. My name is Caleb. Bless you all. Hello, church. My name is Rodney. And uh, anybody know anything about being lost in the fog? I was with uh, eight older siblings, you know, all your life, and you're the youngest, you know, you get kind of drugged through, you know, so. Uh, scripture I stand on is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, you know, trust the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. Submit him in all your ways, and he will direct your paths. And uh, I know that to the fullest because I did my own thing for 40 years, you know. I'm 50 years old. I'm out of East Texas, Silver Springs, Texas. And, uh, I did 20 years in prison behind a meth addiction, you know. And uh, March 23rd, March 22nd, 2023, I was facing 35 alive behind this addiction. And uh, I called Adult Team Challenge, and uh, I talked to a man named Todd, and I told him, you know, I told him where I was at, and I was struggling, and I needed help with my addiction, you know. So I got accepted to the program, and uh, man, it's been a turnaround, dude. I'm talking about the things that used to matter so much, man, I don't even think about them program has saved my life for real. Uh, I'm a, like, like Austin, I'm a staff member there now. I work, I work there and uh, man, they open the doors to me, man, they just, I'm overwhelmed, you know. And uh, I want to thank Kenneth and Esther for welcoming me and uh, part of the family, man. But uh, the program, man, is great. And uh, if you work it, it works. Uh, I did, I got an advanced seminary uh, associate's degree in theology in prison, but I never learned how to apply it, you know. And uh, I'm talking about, I studied Bible hard for seven years, all 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New, Paul wrote 13, you know, I've been there. But I never learned how to apply it until I got to this program. And they have, I'm talking about they got great classes, man, and it's just unbelievable. And, uh, but man, if you open your mind and your hearts to it, man, uh, God is there. And uh, like I said, I stand on that Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. But the one I've really been focusing on here lately, man, is John 15, 5. And he kind of says something where to go on it, you know, stand connected, dude. It's, you know, uh, if you abide in me, I abide in you, you know, and you can't do nothing without me, man. That's just, that's where I'm at today, man, just knowing I got to stay connected to God and stay in this program, man, because I'm safe here, you know. I don't have to worry about uh, not waking up sober. Uh, man, it's a great program, man. That's all I got to say. Thank you all.
God. Hallelujah. Thank you, church. Thank you, Pastor Phil. What an awesome name. Pastor Austin. We're, we're just so thankful to be here today and thankful for this church, for Christian Center, for standing with us, for praying for us. We're in a spiritual battle. Do you know that? Have you noticed we're in a spiritual battle? Amen. But the church of Jesus Christ is triumphant. We're more than conquerors. More than. Not just barely. More than. 
More than. Thank you, guys. We have three groups of guys in three churches this morning. Guys like these. These are the best looking ones, but <laughs> we got guys like these. They're giving their testimony because God's doing something amazing. Something's moving, something's going on. This is a year-long discipleship program. It's not like a two-day kids' crusade. This is something where the Spirit of God, the Word of God, can get a hold of people and bring transformation. I mean, we have, we have a guy studying at Sagu. He says God's called him to be a missionary. We've got these guys that are they're taking... Uh, Berean courses. We're setting up a Berean center so that they can, those that are called can be in ministry. We've got people working in, we've got people working in a lawn care uh, business. Austin there, he's kind of running the, leading the charge there. I don't know what he got, 165 lawns you've been doing? That's Jordan. Austin's the other guy. Jordan's brother. Austin's brother Jordan, 165 lawns they're doing, they've got trucks, they've got zero turns, they've got lawnmowers, they've got weed eaters, they've got sore muscles, <laughs> they've got pole pruners. Not only is it to get your life right with Jesus in the spiritual aspect, but it's to prepare for the future. And uh, we've got this coffee roasting thing that's going to be happening soon, our own coffee roasting, because... Uh, God's going to use that. Not only uh, does the church help us keep things going, but we're trying to do what we can as God opens doors and opportunities to reach more people. I was at the Home Depot the other day, and a gal checked me out. She goes, wow, you, you're adult and teen challenge. What's going on for women? I see something over in Fort Worth, but I want to help out. Why don't you get something going in Dallas? The need's huge. I said, put that on your prayer list. It's being talked about. Yeah. Well, if you have a Bible this morning, we're going to be in the book of 1 Samuel, uh, chapters 15, 16, and 17. You're going to see a lot of verses on the screen. And I'm not going to read all those, but you can follow uh, with the screen or what you, your favorite uh, Bible translation that you I like to use, I grew up with the King James. All my memory verses were from the King James, but you're going to see the New Living Translation on the screen. I want to talk about the heart of a champion and about David. And you say, well, I've heard about David a bunch of times. That's good. I think you're going to hear some stuff you've never heard before. As Pastor said, my wife and I were missionaries, and before we went to the mission field, we're here in Dallas, and our kids are going to a youth group in Duncanville. And their youth group had this ugly tie contest. And so the person that came to youth group with the ugliest tie was going to win two tickets to the Mariners. So we're thinking, where did we find our son, the ugliest tie in existence? We went to the little missionary boutique over on Camp Wisdom Road, and we looked through there, and I'm looking, I said, this tie is so ugly, I've never seen an uglier tie than this. Thank the Lord I don't have to wear a tie this morning, or I'd be singing that old song, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. <laughs> so our son goes to youth group with this tie on, and he comes back with two tickets for him and me. We took a vote, and I decided it was for him and me. And our daughter and my wife, who's seated down here, Esther, and uh, we just celebrated 48 years. And so my son and I, Stephen, we're at, the, we're at the Rangers game, and we're sitting in right field, and I looked down there, and I said, hey, look at that guy. That's Nolan Ryan. Nolan Ryan, he was still pitching in those days. He still holds 51 records. He had 5,714 strikeouts. He pitched seven no 
hitters and had 324 wins. Wow, I'm going, he's a champion. And then I got summoned to court a few years later. Not for me, somebody else. I get this notice in the mail and it says, congratulations, you're on jury duty. I'm going, wow, I'm going to be on jury duty. Uh Uh-uh. I show up, I'm being interviewed. There's 52 jurors there. And uh, so during the break, I mean, they were exhausted interviewing us for this trial. During the break, I'm out in the hallway, and there's this guy sitting over there, and I look at him, and I said, I recognize that face. Everybody else is staring. I go over and sit by him. I said, hi, my name's Phil. He said, I'm Roger. I said, you're Roger Staubach, the quarterback, former quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys. I go, wow, I'm, I'm sitting here by the Heisman Trophy winner. This guy won two Super Bowls. He won the Walter Payton Award. He was the NFL Man of the Year. He won the Presidential Medal of Freedom. This guy has the heart of a champion. So I'm talking to Mr. Staubach, and he's telling me about his faith in Jesus. Going, thank you, Jesus. Today we're going to look at David, the shepherd boy, the musician, the armor bearer, the teenager who was anointed king, a guy who was faithful in the background and stepped up into the foreground and won victories when God said step up. And I've been in the pew a few times in these chairs like we have here, and I'm thinking, well, someday I'm going to be a champion. Or no, I can never be a champion. Or I can never be like those guys. And God's saying, I want all of you to have the heart of a champion. You say, well, why should I do do that? Because the pastor will do it. Isn't that what he's here for? Isn't he supposed to do everything? You read the wrong book if you think that. The church is us, all of us. All of us. I better not get my backhoe out and dig too deep, Pastor. I don't want to put you in a hole. But there's this guy named David. He had the heart of a champion. He had a powerful anointing. He had a different perspective. He had a God-sized faith. He had a different demeanor. He had a different agenda. He had a different vision. He had a definite person. He had a God-given mission. And he accomplished ginormous things For God. You mean David was perfect and he never made mistakes? No, if you've read all the Bible, you see he messed up a time or two. And he had to come back to the foot of the altar down there and get before God and say, Lord, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And don't kick me out of your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. Maybe you're seated here this morning and say, my joy went out the window when COVID showed up. Today's the day to get it back. David, the stage is set. Saul was king because Israel said we got to have a king like everybody else. And Saul got too big for his breeches and his robe, and he said, I don't need these priests, I can do it myself. And he put himself into the place of a priest, and God saying, "Uh -uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. Well, Samuel, the prophet that had anointed the king, he's sad, he's in mourning, he's grieving over what Saul had done. They say maybe he was grieving for 10 years. Saul was not going to be the king. And God said, all right, enough already. It's time to anoint a new king. God says, go to the house of Jesse. And Jesse's sons show up. And Samuel begins looking them over. And in 1 Samuel 16, 7, the Lord says to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, 
for I've rejected him. Isn't it sometimes we think it's all about image, how we look? To God, it's not all about how we look. It's not all about our background or our ethnic origin or where we grew up. God loves us all the same. He says, He says, the Lord doesn't see the things the way you see them. Thank you, Jesus. People judge by outward appearances, but the Lord looks at the heart. So Samuel's checking out Jesse's sons each time God says, no, this is not the one I've chosen. Finally, Samuel says to Jesse, got any more sons? I was the favorite son in my family. Numero uno. Sandwich between my two sisters got picked on from both sides. He says, well, there's one more. There's one more. He's out with the sheep and the goats. So David shows up. I've got a nine-point sermon, Pastor, and there's usually three. I hope you brought your pillows and sleeping bags. (laughs) We're going to ramp this up and get out of here on time. Because if not, my wife will stand up. No, she won't. (laughs) She says, I'll get you later, dude. (laughs) A champion has a powerful anointing. These guys are singing that Andre Crouch song. He filled me with the Holy Ghost. We had some guys get baptized in the Holy Spirit on a Sunday morning a few weeks ago. Some of them got baptized in water. If you haven't been baptized in the Holy Spirit, today's as good a day as any. The power of God comes on you, not so you can get Pentecostal goosebumps and brag about it. It's so you can do ministry and be a champion and do exploits for Him. You see, the church is in this time when we think, oh my goodness, if we could just change the politicians or change this or that, it's time for the power of God to be unleashed in this society and revival to come. (laughs) Revival starts right here. You see, it's an awakening that people who aren't saved need, but you can't revive something that's never been revived. Sometimes we grow cold and God needs to come and the Spirit of God revive us. So Jesse sent for him, David. He was dark and handsome with beautiful eyes. And the Lord said, this is the one, anoint him. So as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of oil. He had been brought and anointed David with the oil. And the Spirit of the Lord, and that's the first verse you saw on the screen, and the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Jesus, when he stood up in the, in the temple, he, what did he read from Isaiah? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. But there was some stuff going on in those days. The king was no longer going to be king. David had been anointed king, but Saul was still the real king. And the Philistines are out there. The Philistines. Who are the Philistines in your life? The forces of the enemy. We have an enemy. And it's not the guy at work. It's not your mother-in-law. It's not your cousin. It's not the guy in church. It's the enemy. Satan. The people of Israel were afraid. They were anxious. They were distracted. They were focused on the problem and not on the solution. They were intimidated and terrorized by a human enemy. 
this dude by the name of Goliath. We have these Goliaths that come along. The second thing, the enemy, know, the champion knows that the enemy doesn't determine the outcome. The enemy doesn't determine the outcome. If you read to the end of the book, the outcome's already been determined because Jesus accomplished victory, took care of the enemy on the cross, and when he rose from the dead, says the Philistines. Mustered their army for battle. That's not like mustard, like you put on your hot dog. Okay, it's mustard. They got them out there. And they're camped there. And the troops are there. And Saul got his troops out there. And there's this guy named Goliath. Nine feet tall. Bronze helmet. Bronze coat of mail weighed 125 pounds. Bronze leg armor. Bronze javelin. The shaft, the head of the spear weighed 15 pounds. Armor bearer walking ahead of him with a shield. He's standing there for 40 days, morning and night ridiculing the people, the Israelites, strutting back and forth. The Bible says that Satan goes about as a roaring lion. We heard, we sang a song about the lion of the tribe of Judah. His name's Jesus. That enemy that roars in your ear has been defeated. Don't listen to him. The enemy doesn't determine the outcome. The third thing is a champion knows that faith, not fear, leads to victory. How much faith? Somebody told somebody, well, you didn't get healed because you didn't have enough faith. How much is enough? Jesus said, if you had the faith of a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, be moved, and it'd be moved. Jesus is in the house. He's preaching. Four people bring this paralytic, let him down through the roof. The Bible says when he saw their faith, a woman with an issue of blood touches the hem of his garment. James wrote the prayer of faith. I don't know how much faith, but there's faith involved when God begins to move. It says in 1 Samuel 17, 11, I won't read all these verses. It says, when, the Israel, when Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. And David's brothers are up there, the three oldest ones. And David's back herding the sheep in Bethlehem. Verse 17, one day Jesse says to David, this is verse 17 of 1 Samuel 17, Take this basket of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread and carry them to your brothers and give them ten cuts of cheese to their, their captain and see how the brothers are getting along. And so they're up there. They're on the battlefront. They're up there. And so David goes and he brings them supplies and greets his brother. The fourth thing is a champion unswervingly obeys God. You ever disobeyed God? Don't raise your hand. We all have. The Bible says all we like sheep have gone astray. So while he was talking with them, uh, verse 23, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, came out of the Philistine ranks and David heard him shout his usual taunt. As soon as the Israelite army saw him, they began to run away in fright. Woo! 
Have you seen the giant? Have you heard the giant? Have you seen this guy? Have you heard this guy? Let's get out of here. Let's exit stage left. Let's make like trees and leave. We're so out of here. We don't have to be that way. We're more than conquerors. A champion is not distracted and discouraged. It's easy to get distracted and get discouraged to get your eyes off of Jesus and start looking at the waves. Oh, this is bad. God's got it. The battle plan is, here's the battle plan. There's a battle plan. Saul has a sign-on bonus. I noticed a lot of sign-on bonuses these days. Haven't seen one for pastors. <laughs> Just saying. The sign-on bonus is if someone stands up to the enemy, they will get a wife and a tax exemption. And then in the fine print, they will also have in-laws. It's not in the Bible. So it says in verse 25, the second part of verse 25, the king has offered a huge reward to anyone who kills him. He will give that man one of his daughters for a wife, and the man's entire family will be exempted from paying taxes. Who? Who wouldn't love that? Who wouldn't love that? Then it says in verse 28, but when David's oldest brother, Eliab, heard David talking to the men, he was angry. You ever been put down by somebody close to you? It hurts. Sometimes we can't be a champion because we're hanging on to hurts. Hey, won't you play another Somebody done somebody wrong song and made me feel at home. Don't live there. Don't park the bus there. You see, condemnation comes from Satan, sometimes from saints. Woo, you mean. And from self. A champion is fearless and courageous. Number six. David steps up to the king. Says, I want to see Saul. Says, the king sent for him. David standing in front of King Saul. Verse 32. Don't worry about the Philistine. David told Saul, I'll go fight him. And Saul says... Don't be ridiculous. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and win. You're only a boy and he's been a man of war. Sometimes we just whimper and go away when somebody says, you can't do that, but through Christ I can do all things. Paul said I can do all. All? All. All. Got it? A-L-L. -L. That's you. That's me. But David persisted. I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. When a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club. I rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and I club it to death. I've done this to both lions and bears and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of who? The living God. The Lord will rescue who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. That's what's happening in adult and teen challenge. The Spirit of God is rescuing men that the enemy 
would like to take down and destroy. Saul finally said, okay, all right, go ahead. Nobody else is stepping up, right? Sign up on that volunteer list back there. Good place to start. And may the Lord be with you. The next one, number seven, which means we only have eight and nine left to go. Oh, we're doing good. A champion is not defined by tradition. You know, tradition's not bad. The first church we pastored, their favorite song was, Jesus is my Savior, we shall not be moved. In His love and favor, we shall not be moved. They stopped the song right there. I'm not kidding. I was on Wednesday night Bible study and I said, folks, we need to pray. We're restarting our girls' program. And this person stood up and said, Pastor, it didn't work then and it ain't going to work now. I'm 26 years old, senior pastor of my first church. I'm the, my knees are shaking. We can let tradition, even good things, define us, but that's not what defines a champion. So here it is, like the tradition is, well, this is how we fight giants. We put on a helmet, we put on a coat of mail, we strap on a sword. You got to look the part. You got to keep up the image. If you want to look at what a real giant slayer looks like, go on Facebook. So David puts on this stuff, right? He tries to walk. He's probably looking about like Lazarus when he came out of the tomb with the grave clothes still on. It was worse than some city slicker trying to be a cowboy. Sometimes, church, we try to dress the part or talk the part and we fall apart. They give him all the Saul stuff and it's not going to work. David says, it's not going to work. I can't go in these. David took them off. You see, it's not tradition that defeats the enemy. It's the power, the spirit of the living God reminding Satan he's already defeated. And the cross, the cross of Jesus. Number eight, a champion faces the enemy head on with what's in his hand. Verse 40, 1 Samuel 17. He picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them in his shepherd's bag. Then armed only with his shepherd's staff and a sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. Goliath walked out toward David with his shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy faced boy. Imagine that. I'm going to drink this water and just leave this thing stuck right on here. It works. Ooh, it fell. He's walking out there in this. Philistine saying, am I a dog? He roared at David. You come out with a stick. He cursed David by the name of his God, small g. Come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and wild animals. Goliath yelled. Shepherd boy. A sling. Five stones. And a staff. Same guy that wrote Psalm 23 and he said, Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cuffs half empty. No, it runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord. A couple of days, no, forever. 
What's in your hand today? My wife and I were attending a church in Bogota, Colombia. At that time, it had 12,000 people. Four services on the weekend. Pastor got up and he said, God's put in my heart that we're going to build a a building so that we can reach 30,000 people. We had a church... That was a church that had people with pensions on Social Security that hardly got any money, business owners, people with resources and everybody in between. And he said, you all can do something. You all can do something. What's in your hand? After we came home from the field years later, that church went on to build that facility and plant more than 30 churches across the country of Colombia. What's in your hand? Number nine, a champion knows the battle is the Lord. Remember Samson? Samson started drifting off. Remember him? He's the guy that had long hair and strong, you know. Got this girlfriend named Delilah. This guy comes to her and says, hey, you got to find out what makes Samson strong. He just killed a thousand of our people with the jawbone of a donkey. And Samson doesn't realize he's drifting away from God. And he says, I'm just going to go out there like I always did and defeat the enemy. He goes out there and he's captured and put in bondage. You see, the battle is the Lord's. It's not me. It's Him, not by might nor by power, but by His Spirit. Says, not me, the Lord of hosts. God's got this. David's thinking, And you're going down, giant. You can give it your best shot with your best stuff, but giant, you're going down. The stuff you have doesn't stand a chance because God's here. This is a God thing. This is God's battle, and Goliath, you're defeated. Maybe today's the day you need to tell the enemy, remember, you are defeated. I've got victory. In my life. David says to the Philistine, verse 45, You come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you with my credit card. I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Today the Lord will conquer you and will kill you and cut off your head. And then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds of wild animals and the whole world will know there's a God in Israel. That's what needs to happen today. Church, this nation, this world needs to know there is a God. An all-powerful God. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues His people, but not with sword and spear. Peter, remember when Jesus was being crucified, whips out his sword, cuts off Malchus's ear. Peter, even though he'd been with Jesus, thought, well, I can do this on my own. And Jesus says, Peter, put your sword away, and he heals his ear. This is the Lord's battle, it says, And He will give you to us. 
It's like David saying, you overgrown, loud mouth, heavy metal, ironclad, state-of-the-art wannabe champion, you're going down for the count. God's got this. You think you're big stuff and you're going to get ahead in life. Move over, dude, because I have something going on that you can't even see. And if you could see it, you wouldn't understand it because I'm strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. I have every piece of God's armor on. I'm resisting you in this time of evil. And when the dust settles, I'm going to be standing up and you're going to be lying down. I'm standing my ground. I've got the belt of truth on. I've got the body armor of righteousness on. I've got the good news shoes of peace on my feet. I've got the shield of faith and nothing you throw at me will harm me. I've got the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God in my mouth. Not a potty mouth like yours. I'm praying. I'm alert. I'm persistent. My God's going to take you down and beside that Goliath, no weapon formed against me will prosper. I'm strong and courageous. And God is my strength and my shield. So stuff a sock in it and put up or shut up. You're all talk and no action. And you're about to get stoned now with drugs or alcohol. But with the rock, the rock, the chief cornerstone's going to put you to sleep. The stone that the builders rejected. The solid rock is here with me to crush your head, you snake Goliath. Thank you, Jesus. So David moves closer. Goliath moves in. David runs out. Reaches in the bag. Takes out a stone. Puts it in the sling. We used to sing this song, Oh, around and around and around and around and around and around and around. And around. One little stone went into the air. And the giant came tumbling down. You know you're old if you know that one. (laughs) Sunday school. Yeah. So, David ran over, pulled Goliath's sword from his sheath. That was a big sword. David used it to kill him and cut off his head. When the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they turned and ran. You see, when the enemy was defeated, the demons of hell were defeated. The men of Judah gave a great shout. There were dead Philistines everywhere, and there was triumph. History tells us that David eventually took the giant skull to Jerusalem to be buried just outside the holy city. David crushed the head of that serpent. Remember the enemy in the garden. David as a son of Adam, crushed the serpent with a stone to the head. He buried Goliath's skull, history says, near a place called Golgotha. The place of the skull. But it was on Golgotha that Jesus, the champion, the second Adam, crushed the head of the serpent and defeated the enemy. It was there that victory that we enjoy was won. The victory was won. I'm almost done here. The commander of the army is saying, who is this guy? He's the son of Jesse. When David returned from killing Goliath, verse 57, Abner brought him to Saul with the Philistine's head still in his hand. Tell me about your father. Saul said, and David replied, his name is Jesse. We live in Bethlehem. Fast forward about a thousand years and there's something going on in Bethlehem. The hotels and motels are all full. 
A man and his pregnant wife show up looking for a room. There's no rooms available, so they end up in the barn. She's in labor, and she gives birth to the greatest champion of them all. And there in Bethlehem, Jesus is born. The I Am, the Way, the Truth, and the Life, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Redeemer, the Lily of the Valley, the Rose of Sharon, the One who went to a hill called Golgotha, was beaten, mocked, crowned with thorns ridiculed and crucified, the one who shed his blood to forgive our sins and pardon us, the one who defeated the enemy, the one who rose from the dead, the one who promised and delivered the Holy Spirit, the one who ascended into heaven, the one who's at the right hand of the Father interceding for us, our great high priest, the one who's coming back on a white horse with his clothing dipped in blood, the conqueror, the deliverer, the king, his name is Jesus. Do you believe He wants us? He wants us to have a heart of a champion. Have a heart of a champion. Pastor, I need you to come and wrap this up for us this morning. Just kind of dropped it right on you. Thank you so much. Amen. Praise the Lord, the heart of a champion. Amen. You know, sometimes we we come to places in life where we feel defeated, but the message today I I think is just powerful because through Christ we're all champions. Amen. You're more than a conqueror. And so this morning as we close, we, we always have time of prayer. How many of you know this is a house of prayer? We, this isn't a social club. We came to meet with God. And today, if, if, you're, if you've been going through some time, you know, struggle, you know, sometimes we, we sort of feel, I guess, embarrassed that we're, we're struggling. And uh, I want you to know something. Everybody has struggled. Everybody has gone through times where they felt defeated, where they've dealt with depression, where they've dealt with anxiety, where they've dealt with fear. You know, all of these things are... are a condition of humanity that we all face at one point or another. Uh, I, I remember a, a time where we, we didn't know, you know, how we were going to buy groceries. Have you ever been to that place? But God. But God came through. Amen. I didn't know how we were going to pay a bill. Have you ever been there? Now, some of you might, might not have ever known that. And praise God, I, I wish I knew that. <laughs> but God came through. You know, there have been times where we've had to pray for healing. You know, I, I remember when I, we, did, we didn't know whether or not my wife was going to be alive for the next five years. But through that faith, amen, through faith. I know what it's like to go to the doctor and the doctor say, I don't know why, you know, this keeps coming back. And after the third surgery in a year, I said, is this the last time? And the doctor said, I don't know. And I remember how defeated I felt. But it was the last time. Amen. Because God came through. He is my champion. Amen. And because He's my champion. I'm a champion. And so today you may you may be struggling with something. You may be you may be struggling with addiction. You may be struggling with depression. You may be struggling in your finances. So I want to give everyone an opportunity to take a minute and bring it to the altar and give it to God. There may be some here that you say, "Well, I'm sort of searching." You know, I I feel like there's something, there's an emptiness within me. Have you ever felt that? That just, just like an emptiness. You just, you don't know how to fill that void in your, in your heart. I want to tell you something. When you put Jesus there, it's like putting that missing puzzle piece right in. And all of a sudden the picture is complete and you're whole. And if you're like that, you say, I've been sort of searching. I've been, I've been online. And it's amazing how people, they want to find something out, they go online. Now, be careful with what you see online. 
But if you've sort of been searching, you've been looking, I want to tell you Jesus. I, I, don't, I don't tell people, try Jesus. Jesus isn't like a Diet Coke. You give your life to God and you watch what happens. Don't just try Jesus. You step on into the water and give your life to him completely and watch what God can do with you. He'll fill that, that emptiness. He'll fill that void. And he will, he will bring a peace in your life, a wholeness. Like the brother said a while ago, that rest that you've never known. If you'll just give Jesus an opportunity to move in your life. So as we stand today, come on, let's stand. If you have a need today, we always, you know, these, these altars. We got these altars out of a, a church that had, they got rid of their altars. And it's not a popular thing, I guess. Maybe, hopefully, it's coming back into style. But we brought these altars in from a church that had taken their altars out. And we got them, we got them for absolutely free. What a great, what a great bargain. But these altars have been laden with tears. It's where people have met God. And so it, it may not be the trend to, you know, come up and pray. But the Bible says that if we would agree together, if we would come together and, and agree upon anything in the name of Jesus, how many of you know that's true? There's power in agreement. There's power in unity. And so I want to ask you, if you have a need, I don't care what it is. We were praying for, a. I want to tell you something. We prayed for uh, Miss Gwen's dog last week. How many know that God cares about everything in your life? Last week they said that, you know, the doctor was saying, you know, it's pretty bad. So I keep, I, I've asked her, I asked her last Wednesday, she said, but he's doing good. And today I asked her, she said, well, he's had some good days, some bad days, but he's still doing better than he was. How many of you know that God can heal your pet? I love the testimony of my dad. My dad talked about uh, they had a milk cow. My, my grandfather went out and anointed that cow with oil and prayed for it. And, that, and the Lord healed that cow. God cares about everything in your life. If it matters to you, it matters to God. Hallelujah. Amen. And so if you have a need, I want you to come. I want you to pray. Let's, let's never leave this place without prayer. Amen. So come. If you have a need, I don't care what it is, join me down at this altar. Hallelujah. And if you need to be saved, if you need to ask the Lord into your heart, this is a good time. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's all just stretch our hands out with these that have needs. How many of you believe that God can do something great? How many of you believe that God can take that, that heart of the champion? Hallelujah. I like that. Who is Jesus Christ and put it in a situation. And we'll come out victorious. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the word. Lord, we thank you for the, the testimony, Father, that was shared today. And we thank you for the scripture and the, and the, the word of inspiration, the word of hope, the word that, that brings faith. Lord, you see those that, hear, that are here today that are struggling, those that may have issues in their life that are hidden. God, we just pray that you begin to do a work. Lord, those that, that cry out to you, Lord, you said that you would that you're, you don't have a deaf ear towards those that cry out to you, Lord. And, and Lord, we, we cry out to you today. We ask you for your salvation. We ask you, Lord, for, for your wisdom. We ask you for your strength. We ask you, Lord, to, to move in these situations, these needs, Father. They're very real, whether they're big or small. It does not matter, God, because you care about us. And we pray that you would begin to move in these needs. We stand in agreement with our brothers and sisters today. We stand in agreement and we walk in faith today, believing, Lord, that every mountain will be moved, that every prayer that is offered to you will be answered, Lord. Every prayer, Lord, every need, Lord, we pray that you meet it according to your will. Hallelujah. 
Because God, we, we may not know your will because your will is better than our will. And so we ask in this way that your will be done because your will, Lord, we might be asking for, for, for a $10 blessing when you might have a million dollar blessing. Hallelujah. So we want your will. We might be asking for freedom from a headache when you know that we have a tumor and that you want to cause that tumor to go away. Lord, we want your will in our lives. We thank you, Father. And we agree in Jesus' name. And everyone say, Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. I agree with my brother. I agree with my brother.